In Washington Irving's famous short story, Rip Van Winkle wanders off into the Catskills Mountains in colonial New York to escape work he doesn't want to do and his nagging wife. A group of Dutchmen invite him to join their party, and he drinks with them, subsequently falling into a deep sleep of 20 years. When he wakes up, everything has changed, as though overnight. His beard is long, his nagging wife has died, his children are grown, and he is no longer living in the British colonies. The American Revolution has taken place, and the townspeople are now discussing the election of George Washington. There's a similar story in early Christian legend in which the seven young men being persecuted in the Roman Empire retreat to a cave in Ephesus to pray, but there they fall asleep and wake up 200 years later during the reign of Theodosius, an emperor more friendly to Christianity. Christianity is now the state religion of the Roman Empire, and there is no need to fear persecution. And again, everything has changed. These stories are designed to showcase the drastic, life-altering impact of certain historical events, the kind of changes that can take a moment to process when they come at you all at once. The American Revolution, the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine, and the Christianization of Europe, and we might add today the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because our disciples, like Rip Van Winkle and the seven sleepers at Ephesus, experienced earth shattering cataclysmic change overnight. On Holy Saturday, they lay down to sleep in the midst of grief, having lost their friend, their hopes, their life's calling. They locked themselves in a secret room for fear of arrest and persecution. And overnight, they woke up in a new era where everything had changed. Jesus was not in the tomb Jesus was risen. God's love had proven even more powerful than injustice, sin, and death. The universe would never be the same. So it's no surprise that waking up to this cataclysmic change overnight, it took them some time to adjust to this new reality. It's no surprise that the grief and trauma of Thursday and Friday didn't disappear entirely overnight, that it took seeing Jesus, hearing his voice, touching him, to truly know and believe. This story is repeated over and over in the accounts of the resurrection. Last week we heard how the women who first found an empty tomb were not overjoyed, but startled, bewildered, afraid. And Mary Magdalene at first did not recognize Jesus. It took seeing him, hearing his voice, touching him, and after that, she could truly know and believe. Where that story from last week leaves off, so begins this week's story a story known as the story of Doubting Thomas, but that's really about what it takes anyone to move from unbelief to belief. Mary Magdalene, having now truly seen and felt the presence of Jesus, goes to the disciples and announces to them, I have seen the Lord. If we pay attention to the details, though, they don't seem to believe her. They're still locked in a room, in fear, in grief. Or maybe they believe her on some level, but it's just that it doesn't feel like everything has changed. Even if Jesus is still alive, he's still a wanted revolutionary, and so are his associates. And even if Jesus is still alive, it's still been an incredibly traumatic week. They're still reeling. They still just need to lock themselves away and regroup. 
Then Jesus appears to them, shows them his hands and his side, and really changes everything. They've seen him now. They've felt him now. They've received his spirit now. And just as Mary Magdalene announced this to them, they announce it to Thomas. We have seen the Lord. Unsurprisingly, just as they didn't believe Mary at first, Thomas doesn't believe them. He needs to see it for himself. And why shouldn't he? It was sight that led to Mary's belief and hope. It was sight that led to the disciples' belief and hope. Thomas is only asking for the same thing experienced by those who came before him. I want to see him for myself. Thomas's request makes a lot of sense to me. When you believe that someone is dead, lost, broken, it takes more than one Easter Alleluia to change that. And I see this all over the place in our world right now. Take the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, to be clear, we're not fully in resurrection mode yet with case numbers still quite high in many areas, a continued need to take precautions. But these Incredibly effective vaccines that we have access to in our nation, especially some of the best vaccines science has ever made, do change everything. And yet, it will take time for many of us to feel safe again in restaurants, in shopping, in crowds, in movie theaters, even in church. I'll confess that I experienced an unexpected jolt of anxiety being around so many people on our outdoor Easter service, even though I knew we were taking safe measures. And beyond feelings of safety, I've heard psychologists and neuroscientists reflect on the way our brains have been actually changed over the past year, and it won't be easy to retrain ourselves to wake up earlier to add hours of commuting to our daily routines, to sit quietly in church instead of chatting and getting up for a coffee refill in the middle of the sermon. Everything is changing, and yet we need to see the change embodied before we really take it in. It will take time and lived experience for many of us to believe deep down in the change. Or, for another example, take the ongoing nationally televised trial of police officer Derek Chauvin. Police convictions for deaths in custody are very rare, but this trial, like the video recordings of George Floyd's death last summer, captured our attention. Something is different. Everything has changed, maybe. This prosecution has produced hours of witness and expert testimony aimed to show a jury that the defendant's use of force caused a black man unarmed to die. An unprecedented number of police officers are breaking the so-called blue wall and testifying against one of their own. And yet, what I hear from so many friends and colleagues and writers who are black and people of color is, we'll see, or I have a bad feeling about this. After all their lived experience, can you blame them that they don't really believe anything is changing until they see it? And even if Chauvin is convicted, even if everything changes and this trial is different than so many before it, in another sense, still nothing will have changed. The trial has been designed to focus on one officer who betrayed his badge. He may be convicted, but will that change the way the average black American experiences policing? When you believe a whole system is dead, broken, 
lost. It takes more than one word of Easter Alleluia to change that. So it's not only Thomas, but all of us, I think, who need to see and touch and experience something to really believe it. And we know that Jesus granted Thomas's request. Just as Jesus had shown up for Mary, shown up for the disciples, he showed up in the flesh for Thomas to see and touch and experience. He invited Thomas to see his hands, to touch his side, to move from unbelief to belief. Until Thomas could cry out with deep conviction, my Lord and my God, now I have seen the Lord, now I believe. One detail that I've cherished about this story over the years is something we might easily overlook. It's that the disciples kept Thomas around that week. And by continuing to fellowship with him, bear with him despite his unbelief, they facilitated an opportunity for him to see and believe. Not only for him to hear the good news that I have seen the Lord, we have seen the Lord, but for him to see Jesus for himself, embodied, alive in the flesh. That detail, I think, comes as a challenge for us as disciples today. Not only to say to the world, I have seen the Lord. Not only to say, Happy Easter, Alleluia, but to show Jesus' living body to the world so that people can see it. Just as Jesus commissions and sends out his disciples in this story, with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have all been sent as Jesus' disciples, not just to say words of welcome and resurrection, not just to say, praise the Lord, or I have seen the Lord, but to embody Jesus alive in this world. Often I hear some church folk lamenting the decline in church-going trends in our nation, wondering why young people aren't in church, why Gen Z and the millennial generation, according to polls, are less affiliated than any generation before from organized religion, wondering why our words of welcome and inclusion haven't drawn racial diversity to our church, why so many people we know just don't seem to care about church traditions. I wonder if this story offers us part of the answer, which no doubt has many facets. But again, when you believe that something is lost, broken, or dead, it takes more than a few words to change that. It takes more than saying, I have seen the Lord. It takes seeing and touching and experiencing the reality of life. Let's take a happy example first. The celebration of Bethany's baptism this week reminds us of every baptism, an event that changes everything. God offers a seal and a sign of belovedness and belonging to a tiny, vulnerable being. And every time a child is baptized, our congregation speaks words of welcome, promising to love and nurture that child in the faith. But the words alone won't change everything. What's really meaningful is how we embody those words of promise in reality. How we come alongside families, not only when they're adding another child to our Sunday school list, but when they're in need of support and encouragement and help. How we love every child with Christ's love, not only when they're tiny and cute, but when they grow and have interests or opinions we may not understand. It takes more than words to believe in resurrection and life. It takes seeing and touching and knowing the embodied reality of Jesus. 
but it takes wor work to embody that reality, especially in cases where there have been long years of experiencing hurt and harm and grief. To use a more pointed example, when you're a black person and your experience of the white church has been exclusion, hierarchy, complicity with racism for hundreds of years in America, it takes more than the words, all are welcome, to change that. Our recent adult ed study group learned about the history of racism in the American mainline church through Jamar Tisby's book, The Color of Compromise. And we saw how deeply ingrained that death and sin and injustice has been in the white church. And we are starting to understand that to repent and correct and transform, it will take more than words of welcome or even I'm sorry. It will take embodied realities that people can see and feel and touch and experience. Those realities may involve some tough concepts like repentance, restructuring, reparations, risk of our comfort. Because especially when you believe something is dead and broken, it takes more than words to believe in resurrection and life. It takes seeing and experiencing the embodied reality of the living Jesus. Or when you're a queer person whose community is heavy with stories of shame and rejection and condemnation from the church, it's going to take more than generic assurances that Jesus loves everyone to change that. It's going to take embodied realities that people can see and touch and experience, perhaps again repentance, perhaps presence at LGBTQ events and communities, or reconsidering the way the church centers heterosexual families to the exclusion of anyone who doesn't fit that mode. When you believe something is dead and broken and lost, it takes more than words to believe in resurrection life. It takes seeing and experiencing the living Jesus. So as followers of Jesus, who, the Jesus who made his presence available to those who needed it, we who call ourselves the body of Christ in the world today have a challenge to make that embodied reality of Jesus known and felt by those who need to experience and while this congregation and individuals in it already live in so many ways consistent with embodying that love and life, I will say that I think we can and must embody it ever more thoughtfully and more deeply. Because it is far, far too easy to get stuck in the pattern of just saying, I have seen the Lord, and welcome, and thinking it's enough. It's far, far too easy to forget what it's like to be Thomas, the one who hasn't yet seen Jesus alive. It's far, far too easy to forget that there's, there are those among us who still feel like Thomas, hanging in this community without having seen or seen in a long time that new life and desperately needing to see it embodied. It's a challenge for us all. And in a way, I think we're in luck because over the next several months, we will be slowly returning to various forms of embodied community and gathering. We will have opportunities to consider where we want to put our energy as we rebuild and refresh and renew. And we can try to keep shouting I have seen the Lord and hope that people hear us by our authentic voices and our improved web presence and our friendly smiles. 
Or we can take this opportunity to really dig deep and think about how we might embody that living Jesus to one another and to the world. I've already seen the living Jesus embodied here at Grace and in the larger church, so I believe that we are up to the challenge. Amen.